Good evening and welcome to everybody and also to, to those who join us online. My name is Shetel van der Smelt. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute and I'm very happy to be able to introduce Johannes Gebhardt, who has been at the Institute before. Um, he is a postdoc uh, fellow at the um, University of Leipzig in the Department of History of Art. Before that, he studied, but he also uh, took his uh, PhD in 2018. Before that, he studied in Leipzig, Passau, and Toledo. And uh, he has a very specific focus on early modern art, and in particular on art theory, materiality, and uh, cult images. He is the author of a book uh, many of you might know, Apparitio Sacri, Occultatio Operis, Zeigen und Verbergen von Kunstbildern in Italien und Spanien, which is a very uh, interesting study um, because it uh, is all about movable uh, pictures and in particular the, the way in which uh, cult images were staged and the devices that were used to turn this into a kind of spectacle for religious reasons. So you can see he has a very broad approach uh, there's also much uh, interest in transcultural art history, which is, of course, a, a very important topic nowadays. Um, and uh, it's also uh, today he will talk about this uh, similar uh, subject. Um, last year, he uh, had the privilege of uh, receiving a very prestigious fellowship at Villa Itati and the Prado. This is kind of joint fellowship, which allowed him to do even more research on Italian and Spanish art. And we have we were having a chat just before the lecture and he said, yeah, I'm now focusing on blood. And that seemed to me initially only a kind of footnote, but then it becomes bigger and bigger. And we will now, as you will probably explain, uh, he's planning to write a book on this, uh, on this specific topic. So that's uh, quite exciting. The, the title of today's lecture is um, Christ's Petrified uh, Blood. It's about heliotrope cameos in early modern Europe and beyond. Thomas, please, your side. Thank you. So, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's um, a pleasure to be back after three years. I was here shortly before the COVID um, pandemic hit, so good to be back. So let's start. Um, okay. Christians have placed blood with its complex symbolic implications at the core of their ritual and artistic practices since the late, late antique period. Objects supposedly connected to the blood of Christ have been considered powerful witnesses of salvation, such as the column on which Christ was scourged and tortured before the crucif uh, during before the crucifixion, now in the church of Santa Prasede in Rome, or the Rock of Golgotha, the site of Christ's crucifixion, and the stone of unction where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. Both stones are housed in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Soaked in Christ's blood, these stones are referred as some of Christianity's most precious relics. At the same time, semi-precious stones in red shoes were incorporated into works of art as symbolic references to the blood of Christ. The heliotrope or bloodstone is a material at the center of this tradition and of today's lecture. A green jasper speckled with red spots resembling blood, the material properties of this species of stone perfectly align with the artistic search for ways to represent and substantiate the salvific message of the incarnation and the passion. Thus, Bloodstone was favored to produce works of art, in particular small cameos depicting violent scenes of Christian iconography. Just to give you a quick impression, I am showing you here the cameo we used for the flyer 
a bust of Christ with a crown of thorns today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I will come back to that later on. The stone's popularity arose from the belief that unlike other stones, the heliotrope not only symbolized the blood of Christ, but materialized Christ himself. In both the Latin and Byzantine tra uh, Christian tradition, shared across centuries, we find numerous works of art made of heliotrope that demonstrate the belief in the connection of this stone to the blood of Christ. Thus, it is surprising that the bloodstone has not yet played a significant role in the broader scholarly discussion on the metaphorical and rhetorical usage of stones in art and visual culture. Despite the excellent research into the symbolism and materiality of stones in theological and art theoretical discourses on medieval and early modern lapidaries, no comprehensive study is dedicated to the heliotrope and its place in the Christian artistic tradition. In today's lecture, Christ's Petrified Blood, Heliotrope Cameos in Early Modern Europe and Beyond, I would like to try to remedy this gap and focus on a source-based analysis of the iconography, materiality and symbolic meanings of the stone in the early modern Western artistic tradition when the production of heliotrope cameos seems to have reached its artistic peak. I will spend the first part talking about the origins of the heliotrope and the trope of its supposed magical powers in literary works from the ancient world to the Renaissance. The second part um, is devoted to analyzing the Christian iconography of bloodstone cameos. In this context, the focus will be on the analysis of written sources that directly link the stone to the passion of Christ. In the last part of this lecture, I will extend the discourse on the materiality of bloodstone to other artistic media, such as pietre dure, painting and sculpture. The topic I'm going to present to you today is largely based on the research I conducted during my time as Joint Fellow of Villa Itati and the Museo Nacional del Prado in Florence and Madrid. It is part of the research for a chapter of my second book titled Blood Dimensions of Liminality in Early Modern Italian and Hispanic Art. So the material I'm showing today is still work in progress. Florence in particular has proven to be the perfect location to work on this topic due to the remarkable amount of works of art made of bloodstone in Florentine museum collections, such as the Museo degli Arcenti in Palazzo Pitti or the Museo del Opificio delle Pietre Dure. But before analyzing the use of bloodstone in the Christian artistic tradition, let us begin by taking a closer look at the stone's origins as well as the popularity that it has gained with regard to its supposed magical powers. For this purpose, I want to show you a manuscript that was produced in the Viceroyalty of New Spain, today Mexico, in the second half of the 16th century. The illustration is from Bernardino de Sahagún's Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, written around 1577 better known as the Codex Florentinus, held in the Biblioteca Laurenciana in Florence. Sahagún, a Franciscan friar, together with indigenous assistants, had prepared this book as an encyclop encyclop encyclopedic work on the New World. In the chapter, Piedras Preciosas, or On Precious Stones, he gives the following explanation of this illustration, and I quote in English, there are also some stones that are called blood stones. It is a brown stone with a lot of little drops that look like blood. This stone has the ability to stop nasal bleeding." End of quote. Sahagun describes the heliotrope characterized by its red blood-like blood veins, although depicted here as literally sweating blood. According to the friar, indigenous people in the Americas believed it to have a hemostatic effect <coughs> in the case of illness and healing powers in general. With this description, he draws attention to these medicinal uses and the magical properties that have been attributed to the stone in Europe since ancient times. For example, in the 37th book of his Historia Naturalis, Pliny the Elder writes, and I quote again, 
Heliotropium is found in Ethiopia, Africa, and Cyprus. It is of a leek green color, streaked with blood red veins. It has thus named it has been thus named from the circumstance that if placed in a vessel of water and exposed to the full light of the sun, it changes to a reflected color like that of blood. In the use of this stone also, we have a most glaring illustration of the imputed effrontery of the adepts in magic, for they say that it will render the person invisible who carries it about him." End of quote. According to Pliny, it is the influence of the sun that gives the stone its blood-like appearance, as well as its name, heliotrope. In addition, the stone's supposed power to grant invisibility is a trope that runs through many medieval and early modern literary works. For example, the Libro de Alexandre, a Spanish medieval poem about Alexander the Great written around 1200, mentions the heliotrope's power of invisibility granted al hombre que la tiene no la pueden ver, to the man who cannot be seen in possession of the stone. Similar tales of invisibility attributed to the heliotrope can also be found, for instance, in Dante's Divine Comedy. To this notion, Dante alludes when he sees the damned running about under a hail of fire, senza sperar per tutto o heliotropio without hope of hiding hole or heliotrope, which was pointed out by Urte Kras in her article on the narrative symbiosis between painters and stones. In Boccaccio's De Camerone, it finds its way into legends of artists and their relationship to magical stones, as in the story of Calandrino, whose artist contemporaries Bruno and Bufalmaco convince him that he is invisible in possession of the heliotrope that according to Boccaccio can be found in the Munione River near Fiesole. Interesting as they are, art theoretical discourses on narratives about the relationship between artists and magic invisibility stones are not my subject today. Instead, I will focus on the blood at the center of my inquiry, that is, the use of heliotrope to portray blood in works of art with a special emphasis on cameos. In recent scholarship on the semantics of stone with regard to the heliotrope and its blood analogies, and especially its use in art, still lacks an in-depth analysis. Giorgio Vasari's Vite includes a relevant passage about this in his life of Matteo del Nazaro Veronese, where he calls the artist one of the excellenti intagliatori di camei e gioie, or excellent carvers of cameo, cameos and jewels. Vasari continues, and I quote, Venutoli un bel pezzo di diaspora alemani, verde e macchiato di gocciole rosse, come sono i tuoni. Vi intagliò dentro un deposto di croce con tanta diligenza che fece venire le piaghe in quelle parti del diaspora che erano macchiate di sangue. End of quote. According to Vasari, the cameo, depicting a deposition from the cross, was sold by Matteo to Isabella d'Este. Even if we cannot identify this work of art today, Vasari draws attention to a genre of object widely used in Italy, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, which can be found in collections all over the world. These are mainly cameos with a common characteristic Vasari emphasizes the artistic use of a stone's natural veining to represent blood in a work of art. The list of early modern treatises mentioning this obvious visual blood analogy with regard to the heliotrope is long. I only want to mention Ludovico Dolce's Trattato delle Gemme che produce la natura, discussing the popularity of the stone for artistic purposes due to its blood-like appearance, con gocce sanguinose, a similar passage can be found in Filippo Ballinucci's Vocabulario Toscano, in which he describes the stone as verde a certe macchie rosse a guisa di sangue. So let me finally show you a few examples of such objects. I like the time to address the dating and provenance of each object today. So I will briefly present a selection of those I have identified so far, and it's already more than 100, along with their most frequent subjects. 
Most of these cameos display Christian motifs largely based on acts of violence. These cameos seem to have been highly popular already during the Byzantine period. Between the 10th and 12th centuries, Byzantine artists produced splendid heliotrope cameos, mostly depicting Christ Pantocrator or martyr saints. Here you can see three examples from left to right in the British Museum, the Kremlin Museum and the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. These cameos continued to circulate and were integrated into reliquaries and other composite works of art over the following centuries. One example of such an object is the pectoral of Archbishop of Zaragoza in Valencia, Alonso de Aragon. At the center of the pectoral is a Byzantine cameo with Christ Pentocrator. A comprehensive analysis of the artistic use of bloodstone in the Byzantine tradition certainly provides enough material for another lecture, maybe for next year, as I'm currently planning to explore this topic thoroughly in the coming months. So let us focus on the 16th and 17th centuries, as promised. And it is not surprising that Vasari highlights Matteo del Nazaro's talent and craftsmanship with an example of bloodstone, since the production and of heliotrope cameos reaches another peak during that time. These cameos are generally identified in collection databases as being of Italian or Tuscan origin and often from the workshop of Ottavio Miseroni, a descendant of the Milanese Miseroni family, famous for their reputation as stone carvers at the court of Rudolf II in Prague. The painting by Karel Skreta gives us an insight into the family's business. Within this broader network of cameo production, we find portraits of Christ in profile with the stone's red dots simulating blood dripping from the crown of thorns. The use of the dots varies between the precise positioning of drops, which you can see in this version from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, or a similar object in the collection of the British Museum and more abstract overlays of red blobs that stretch across the cameo surfaces, almost like a Jackson Pollock painting, as you can see in the bust of Christ in the Hermitage collection in St. Petersburg. There are also scenes of the crucifixion, the one on the left also in the British Museum, the one on the right currently on display in the Museo degli Argenti uh, in Palazzo Pitti. As I've said, the Museo degli Argenti houses a remarkable collection of heliotrope cameos. One of the most impressive ones is certainly the Massacre of the Innocents, with the blood spreading across the entire surface of this horrendous scene of Christian iconography. An indirect, more veiled reference to the blood of Christ can be made in this scene of the Last Supper, in which the red dots announce the suffering of Christ during the Passion. Another analogy for Christ's death on the cross and the blood he shed for humanity can be identified in a pelican feeding its offspring with its own blood in the Landesmuseum Württemberg in Stuttgart. The direct connection to Christ is revealed when the object is turned over, showing a bust of Christ. A cameo depicting another scene of the Passion, Christ at the Scorching Pillar, can be found on the so-called Buch Chalice today, chalice in, uh, today in the Hinwood Museum in Washington, D.C. And finally, for a lamentation scene, also in the Hermitage Collection in St. Petersburg, the stone's material properties were used to imitate Christ's wound on his right hand that was caused by the violent act of the crucifixion. A similar iconography, a man of sorrows, was integrated into a small tabernacolo made by Luigi Valadier in Rome. Linda Müller, a former fellow at Villa Itati, was kind enough to bring this object to my attention. Using the stone for its color to produce these bloody scenes seems obvious. But are there any written sources relating this analogy, especially to represent the blood of Christ and his passion 
directly to Christian stone symbolism and specifically to the heliotrope. Or, as Vasari says, is heliotrope simply a stone that, by virtue of its material structure, is particularly suited as a means of expression for the artistic representation of blood? In this regard, theological treatises on gemstone allegory, or so-called lapidaries, which deal especially with the color symbolism of precious stones, are of particular interest. Among the most important are Isidore de Seville's Etymologie in the 7th century, the Venerable Bede's explanation of the Apocalypse, also 7th century, or the Book of Minerals written by Albertus Magnus in the 13th century. All of them mention heliotrope, but it is not singled out with regard to blood. In general, it is simply the color red that is discussed as a symbol of the Passion of Christ, regardless of the material, with one exception, though, and that is the 14th century French author Petrus Bergorius. The author, mostly known for his Ovidius Moralizatus in his Reductorium Morale, writes about the heliotrope as follows, and I quote, Heliotrope is a green stone streaked with blood, red drops, and veins. This is a wonderful effect because when you put it in water and expose it to the sun, in it, it immediately changes the air so that the sun appears bloody. You've heard that passage today. Like all other authors I have mentioned, Bercorius refers to Pliny the Elder and his description of the heliotrope. But contrary to the descriptions in other medieval lapidaries, Bercorius goes a significant step further in his interpretation of the heliotrope. He goes on, and I quote again, the stone is Christ, this stone is Christ when he was sprinkled with drops of blood during the Passion, end of quote. Bergorius is the only source that I have found so far that makes a direct analogy between the heliotrope and Christ and his blood shed during the Passion. According to Bergorius, the heliotrope not only symbolized the blood of Christ, but materialized Christ himself. Iste lapis est Christus. So when George Didi Ubermann in his seminal work on Fra Angelico and his painted marble panels in San Marco states that, and I quote, Christ was symbolically anticipated by many scriptures in the form of a stone, perhaps we should add to this list the heliotrope, which in terms of blood symbolism has not yet been part of the scholarly discourse on stones. What I do not believe, however, is that Bergorius was the first Christian author to make this direct analogy to the Passion of Christ in the context of the material properties of the heliotrope. And I am looking forward to discussing that with you after this lecture. However, Bergorius' brief but important additional characterization of the stone certainly contributed to the development of the legend of the creation of the heliotrope. Interestingly, 18th and 19th century scientific treatises on mineralogy seemed to contribute to the dissemination of this legend. For example, in his book on gems and precious stones published in 1896, the mineralogist Henry George Smith states as follows, and I quote, there is a tradition believed in the age of superstition that at the crucifixion, the blood of Christ falling upon a dark green jasper produced the red spots." End of quote. When you Google these Christian legends, you will probably end up on one of the hundreds of esoteric or jewelry websites that refer to that Christian origin of this stone. This legend has been applied to other Christian figures as well. According to Friedrich Benedikt Bruckmann's treatise on mineralogy, written in 1773, the so-called Stephanstein, the Stephen Stone, was born when the early Christian martyr was executed by stoning to death with his blood dripping down to earth. The Christian legend also joins a list of pagan stories in which stones are created through the bloodshed, a trope that can be traced back to ancient times. For example, when Kronos castrated his father Uranus, the blood and semen that dripped onto the earth created not only Aphrodite, but also the hematite. 
But let us return to the quote of the Christian author Petrus Bertholius. Iste lapis es Christus, quando fuit cutis sanguineis superspersus excilicet in passione. As I have shown, there is no doubt that Bertholius' analogy adds a crucial aspect to the understanding of the symbolic complexity of these small objects in the context of Christian belief. In order to show you the dimensions and potential for further art historical research on this specific topic, I would like to spend the last part of uh, this talk extending the discourse on bloodstones, materiality and symbolic meaning of the stone to other artistic media. When I visited the Opificio delle Pietre Dure in Florence, a cabinet filled with precious Pietre Dure caught my attention. Is it a coincidence that a dark green red vein bloodstone was used to represent the rock on which the cross stands? Or is it rather the case that the person who commissioned the cabinet was aware of such a symbolic reference articulated through the bloodstone? The small, the small house altar with a crucifixion now in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna could serve as a comparative example to support this hypothesis. The columns, the niche and the rock on which the cross stands, they are all made of bloodstone. Another Pietre Dure work at the Occhificio depicts the binding of Isaac. The central scene in which the angel prevents Abraham from sacrificing his son is set against a dark background made of bloodstone, thus stressing the prefiguration of Christ's sacrifice. Another Pietre Dure work at the Opificio depicts uh, a Ciborio, which uh, depicts uh, the chalice with the host and is set against the bloodstone background, emphasizing the salvific message of the Eucharist. The Pietre Dure examples I have shown here are only a selection of works in this category that deserve further study, particularly in the context of the symbolic meaning of bloodstone, which has been emphasized in catalogues largely for its decorative aesthetic value. Let's switch to painting. In his book Painting in Stone, Fabio Berry describes the inner part of the verso of Pietro Lorenzetti's Man of Sorrows here to the left, now in the Lindenau Museum in Altenburg as, and I quote, marbled in cream, red and blue streaks that suggest Christ's flesh, veins and wounds, end of quote. I think we should also consider the painted frame, which seems to be imit uh, seems to imitate the material heliotrope representing the body of Christ on the rector. And finally, sculpture. I believe sculptures in particular have great potential for contextualizing bloodstone objects within current discourses on materiality, thus contributing to the broader scholarly research being conducted, for example, by Iris Wenderholm in Hamburg or Frank Fernbach, who in his recently published book, Quasi Vivo, describes the field of tension between material object surface and the associated processes of vivification. With respect to the imitation of blood by using the natural structure of or veining of certain stones, the following objects have taken a prominent position in the dis discussion of the material of the stone. For his Christ with flagellum in the Museo del Bargello, Matteo Civitali used the dark discoloration of the marble to imitate the hematoma that Christ suffered from the constant blows he received during his passion. Balthasar Permosa's versions of Christ at the Scorching Pillar are certainly among the most vivid. For his sculptures, he used a special limestone from Untersberg, Austria, imitating the bloody wounds caused by the flagellation of Christ. An interesting object of comparison that hasn't been part of this scholarly discourse yet is a small 
sculpture of Christ at the scorching pillar in the Louvre, which might be one of the most precious objects made of bloodstone. Grace Harpster, also former fellow at the Philaetati, brought this object to my attention. In contrast to other materials, such as the marble and the limestone used for Civitalis and Permosa sculptures, the heliotrope not only imitates Christ's wound, it materializes Christ himself. The stone is Christ. I hope to have shown the symbolic dimensions of heliotrope that was a widespread material used for the depiction of scenes of Christian iconography across different artistic media. Let me conclude today's talk by returning to the first slide of the presentation. I use Bernardino de Sahagún's description of the Mexican Piedra de Sangre in order to show the widespread dissemination of this stone as well as its supposed magic powers and medicinal uses in the new world. But what about the artistic pro uh, production? Do similar works of art exist in Latin America? To answer these questions, we have to go back to pre-Columbian times. This small sculptural object is a heart that was made by an unknown Aztec artist and is dated around 1500, at a time when the Spanish conquerors had not yet arrived at Tenochtitlan. The heart was probably produced as a religious object in the ritual context of human heart sacrifice, a common ritual practice in Aztec religious culture. Heart sacrifice was most often described as occurring on top of pyramids where victims were stretched over a sacrificial stone. The Codex Malia Vecchiano, a 16th century manuscript, now in the Biblioteca Nazionale Centrale in Florence, gives us an idea of how such a ritual killing might have taken place. Sacrifices included the removal of the heart, which was later dedicated to the sun, to keep the sun in motion and the world balanced. In the case of the Aztec heart, the color red within the material structure of the stone evokes the Russian blood frozen in stone. According to Patrick Thomas Hayovsky, who contributed to the recent Itati volume, Sacrifice and Conversion in the Early Modern Atlantic World, the round circle at the center of the heart is a symbol called Chalchihuitl, and it symbolizes blood. Thus, its material properties, again, perfectly align with the artistic ways to re represent the bodily liquid that played a crucial role in Aztec religious culture. In this case, of course, the object did not substantiate the Christian salvific message of the incarnation and the passion. It was rather directly linked to the repetition of the sacrificial ritual guaranteeing the continuation of Aztec society through bloodshed. Admittedly, I have only been able to scratch the surface of the artistic use of bloodstone in this talk today. However, I hope I have at least been able to point out some of the many questions that arise when analyzing these fascinating objects. All of these artifacts are connected to each other by a liquid that, like no other, has the capacity to open up complex dimensions of symbolic meaning across cultures and their religions until today. Blood. So thank you very much for your attention.